I, I, I've often said this to people. I'd rather be lucky than good. Now, you know, hmm. you could go out and work real hard and make a million dollars, or you could bum around behind the building and find a suitcase with a million dollars. It'd be easier if you found a million dollars. You know? <laughs> but, but my deal was I was ready when the opportunity uh, struck, and I was able to carry the load when they put the when they put the reins on me and saddled me up. I was able to pull the load because there's been a lot of guys that come along after us, and they don't they don't they for some reason or another they don't really get woven into people's mind. People don't accept it. So I was one of the guys, and it was a twofold thing because I'd always been into sports and exercising and working out and stuff, and I still do all my life. And I was kind of ready, guys, when I got the uh, when I got the, the chance and the opportunity. And I realized it was a tremendous opportunity. And I realized early on that sometimes the windows of opportunity don't open for you very many times in your life. So I wanted to capitalize on it because I knew the business was going to be a fast business. It was going to be a quick business, but it wasn't going to be a real long one. And I wanted to make sure that I did as as much as I could and be there. And uh, to be a part of that whole thing, I mean, we did some really – uh, as you as you've talked about earlier, some revolutionary stuff and some stuff that really is uh, sets the benchmarks. I mean, we were the first ones doing pay per views, and listen, I remember the first WrestleMania. I would have been in that first WrestleMania had I not got my knee tore up in, in, in February the twenty fifth, nineteen eighty five, out in San Diego, California, because Hulk and I were in a match with Brutus the Barber Beefcake and Johnny Valiant, and I re- sustained a real bad knee injury, or I would have been on that very first card, that first WrestleMania. This happened uh, just like a month or two before. I couldn't do it, but I've been on many since then, and I've seen the evolution of this business and the fans and everything. And uh, listen, I got to say this too: coming from Kentucky, you know, I'm from from a little town down here in Kentucky. You know, you always hear a lot about the big city, especially New York. But I have to tell you this: when I first came to New York and the New Jersey area as the hillbilly Jim character in Rankin, I never had more people being nice to me in my life ever than the New Yorkers, even the folks down in Manhattan, the people down in the city were wonderful to me. Everybody said, oh, New York is a fast place. Well, you know, I'm kind of a fast-talking kind of guy anyway, and I kind of like that kind of pace, but I found everybody totally wonderful to me. I didn't make, listen, I got to say this, I've met more jerks in my own state than I ever met in New York. Hmm. That's true. And, and that's because of the Hillbilly Jim thing. I mean, they were so nice to me, and the fans were so wonderful, and they still are. Like I say, I go do the autograph shows all the time, and, and they come up to me and tell me great stories, and they bring pictures that I took with them many years ago, and we go down memory lane, and, and they couldn't be any more kind to me. And, uh, you know, that's a good thing, because that really, if you think about it, guys, that's what this pro wrestling business is, should be all about. If you're nine or if you're 96, there should be somebody or somebody's on that card when you go to see the shows or watch them on TV that you really like. It should be an entertaining thing for you, and it lets you kind of uh, be a little vocal if you want to be, lets you cheer if you want to, lets you boo if you want to, but it should be, bottom line, a great time for the wrestling fans. And I think that if you forget that, you leave out the most important part. Because, listen, Without any fans, there is no sports. I don't care if it's baseball, basketball, football, pro wrestling. The fans are the lifeblood. And so often you see and you think that a lot of times the fans kind of get left in the dust. But I think that the wrestling fans have a more open communication with the wrestlers. We're more approachable. We make ourselves more approachable. And I think that's something that endears a lot of fans to pro wrestling. That's uh, definitely true, and it's funny you said that uh, New Yorkers are friendlier than, mm-hmm. you know, uh, people in Kentucky. It's possibly the first time that's been said. Usually, you know, it's it's the other way around, but it's the wrestling fans. They really appreciate They respect the That's legend. my experience. That's, hey, listen, that's my experience. They have been more – listen, hey, listen, how bad is it anywhere you go in the United States of America, mostly in North America, but just take this. If you're Billy Jim at that time, I I felt like wherever I was at, I was at home because everybody was so good to me. People offered, hey, man, can I buy you lunch? Can I get you this? Can I get you a drink? Can I take it? If you needed to ride or if something happened, God forbid, and you didn't have a place to stay, there's people that would take you to their house and let you sleep at their house and take you to the airport or give you a ride. I felt like the whole world was like because they were so into the WWF product at that time because it was so hot. And they treated us so good. I mean, every time we roll in town, they treated us just, just uh, first class, and everybody was always there. And it, they don't—they don't listen. They don't come to see you because they don't like you. 
even if you're a heel or a, or a bad guy, they still come to see you because they want to watch you. And but but they don't come to your matches because they don't like you. They like us. And you know what? In my case, that guys, they showed it to me. They were so nice to me. I I, I mean, I never forget that. I never will. You know, I'm just thinking about your career. You know, you, like you in the WWF, you quote unquote came in as a fan. But that mm-hmm. first interaction you had with Roddy Piper, and he's another guy, another all-time legend, one of those guys that cannot be forgotten. Yeah. You know, you're on you're on Piper's bed. What is your you know your thoughts, kind of dealing with a guy with the gift of gab like Roddy Piper? First of all, uh, one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest speakers that there ever was ever with a microphone. The guy we call it on the stick was RP. Roddy was as good. I remember all those times they used to they used to show him early early on before he even came to the WWF. Uh, he was he was down in Georgia Championship Wrestling. You'd see him on that super station out of Atlanta, and he when you gave him that microphone, man, it was sizzling. He could just absolutely kill you with his promos and his mind and all those little weird think eccentric things he would do. Uh, he was the best. So when I had that Piper's pit there, you know, I said, look, I'm gonna have to go out there. I'm gonna still be to do the hillbilly gym thing and uh, do all the stuff I got to do because you know I wanted to kind of if you think about it back in those days. All the guys stayed pretty much in their character, which a problem with today is a little bit of this. When the bell rings, they all look the same. They all start doing the same moves. <laughs> they all start taking bumps and flying around and doing all kinds of stuff to where it looks gray. It blends to, even if they come to the ring with some elaborate entrance. But see, in my day, I'm Hillbilly Jim. What's a Hillbilly? A Hillbilly is a good old boy. That's a nice little guy, but he ain't supposed to ever be real sharp in the ring. He ain't supposed to ever figure it out and be a scientific wrestler like Bret Hart or Bob Backlund or one of those guys. He's supposed to be a good old boy. If you get him riled up, he'll come into fighting. And then he wants to wrestle, he said, he gets mad. And so that's kind of the way I did it. I tried to keep myself where I never got real sharp in the ring. And it wouldn't matter to the fans even if I, if I won or if I lost. They were still with me. See, and that's the, that's the dividing line because you think about it back in those days. You had your Rowdy Roddy Pipers, you, you know, who's gone now, and you had Jimmy Snooker, who's gone now. You had a lot of those guys, and they all had their characters, and they all did their thing. It was Hulk Hogan's thing to hook up in the ring, in the middle of the ring, and you bow up, and he dropped the leg on the guys. You know, that was his thing. The Iron Sheik at that time, he'd do the camel clutch. And, you know, we'd all have our special little things we do. And I think people liked it better like then. In, in, in our day, I know you guys did, and they showed us because it didn't matter if we were in the Garden or if we were in the Spectrum, if we was out in Nassau, if we were in the Meadowlands. It didn't matter what we were. It would always be a sellout. And the people would always show up, and we would always do our thing. So those are the things that I think about Roddy, who, who became a real good friend of mine. As you know, a few several years back we all did that Legends House, and now that's – that's really precious to me because I got to spend a, about a month with Roddy every day. And, of course, Tony Adams was in there and Jimmy Hart and Howard Finkel and Pat Patterson and Gene Okerlund. And, uh, and we had uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. And we had just a wonderful time in there. And now that Roddy's gone, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's painful to think about that. And uh, of all the guys at that house, I might digress a little bit. I, would have, I wouldn't have thought that Roddy would have been the first to go out of a group of us because – you know, he looked great, and uh, it was just a treasure to be around those guys. And, you know, let me say something that the listeners might not know. You know, we all know each other in the wrestling business, but we don't really, most of us, spend a lot of quality time with each other. Aside from the shows that we do, the pay-per-views, or you might see the guy on the road if you're wrestling. But I actually got to spend about a month every day with these guys. And I'm going to tell you something. When you're around people for a month, you really get to know them. And I got to see all these guys in ways that I never knew them before. And it was uh, it was a tough thing being doing that reality shoot. And it was kind of hard. And it was a lot of stress at first with the guys. But you know me, I just I just said, I'm going to sink back and I'm going to enjoy every doggone minute of this because I know I'll never get to do it again. And you know what? As this turned out, we were the only ones that ever did a Legends House. And it don't look like they're going to do any more. And even if they do more, we were the first group. So there you go such a great show and obviously us being fans of that era probably you know probably more than any of the era it's just one of those things that's like uh, it's really cool seeing these guys like that and looking at it it's like 
you realize like these guys are all larger than life. I know it's like reality TV, but still, I mean, Piper and you and, and Atlas, only guys like you guys are larger than life. Is that are what's you, missing in in today's wrestling? Because I mean, you don't get that quite feel anymore that, that you no, know you these don't. guys are bigger than anything. Now, now, and listen, and, and listen, y'all know me. I tell you like it is. I, I'm not going to color code anything or say anything, but I don't really have any beefs with anybody because you know, like you said earlier at the beginning of the show, and I appreciate what you said when you brought me on. I never really got too much heat with anybody because I'm not that kind of guy, you know. I'm not one of those guys that really, uh, you know, uh, does things to guys. I never undermined anybody. I never did anything really, you know, deceptive, behind-the-scenes stuff. But the business has changed a lot, and, and I'm not going to sit here today with you guys on your show and put down anything. I'll just say this. It was as good as it ever was in my day. It's just different now. Now, every generation builds off of the next one behind them. And the guys that we uh, had in our day, the young boys now, when we go around with the younger guys, they treat us like kings. Now, I remember this. I will say this. When I came up in the business, the guys that were behind us, most of the boys did not like them because the guys that came up behind us didn't really treat the young boys that were breaking in like Hogan and uh, and, uh, and and Beefcake and uh, guys like they didn't treat them very well. So consequently... Our guys that I was around, they had a lot of heat with these guys. They didn't like the old timers because the old timers tried to take advantage of them. As now today, they look up at us and revere us. It's very, it's almost touching, guys, the way these guys are so kind when they come around us and treat us so good. And it's the way it ought to be because it's the way you should show respect for people. But us guys in the eighty, we never really treated anybody bad, and uh, they looked upon us like it's a big deal. And I think we did something that started the whole thing that came to where it is now. Now, it just changes all the time. You know, it might not be for me now. You might not know who's who on there. But I tell you, every generation has its uh, different way of doing things. I think the wrestling business, guys, is just a reflection of our society uh, in, in, a, in a synopsis. I think it's just a big part of what's going on in our society. You know, our society is a quicker society now. Everything is digital. Everything is high tech. And, and a lot of people are losing some of the real meaning of things, in my opinion. But, you know, people, and here's another thing I say people don't find out till they find out. 